On the 29th of October 1970, I was born in apartheid South Africa. By that time, Nelson Mandela was already 52 years of age and spending his 3009th day in prison for fighting apartheid. Growing up in, as a conservative in South Africa those days, I believed that Nelson Mandela was the enemy. I was ruled by my superiority complex through the media, the religion, through the education system, we were brought to believe, we were indoctrinated and manipulated in every possible way to believe in the system of segregation, the system of apartheid, the system based on racism. You see, white people and black people didn't, didn't have the same rights during apartheid. White people had proper housing, access to medical facilities, and they could move around freely within their own country. Black people did not have those rights. They lived in separated areas, without water, sanitation, electricity, and they couldn't move around freely without proper approval from the authorities. They were constricted to the segregated areas, and they had to use different buses and benches and beaches, other buses and benches and beaches than whites. You see, a supremacist is never present in the struggles of other people. And I, too, was absent from the struggles of the majority of the people in my country for most of my young life. Before Nelson Mandela received his, or got his lifetime imprisonment sentence in 1964, these were his last words. I have fought against white domination, and I have fought against black domination, I have cherished the ideals of a democratic and free society in which all persons can live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. I wasn't aware that these were his ideals and that this is what he was imprisoned for. To me, Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. I was brainwashed into believing that he's the enemy. Little did I know that these, are, these ideals are things that I could describe to myself. Then in 1994, you'll all remember where you were on the day, Nelson Mandela became the first democratically elected president in South Africa. The world rejoiced, except for the whites. We feared the worst. In our communities, military and security forces were deployed, protecting us. We expected anarchy and revenge and retaliation for years of oppression. <clears throat> on the day of his inauguration was a public holiday. I put in extra hours in my previous job, working on a backlog that I had at work, and that day I was absent from history too. Then, a few months after his inauguration, I nevertheless accepted a job in President Mandela's office, purely because it was conveniently close to where I lived, never thinking, of course, that I would have to meet my people's enemy or the president of South Africa, until I nearly bumped into him one day. I was walking into an office to deliver a document when this crowd of people came walking out of, it, out, of, out of the door which I was supposed to use. Suddenly I noticed these were all bodyguards in front of me, men dressed in dark suits, some of them wearing sunglasses indoors, talking to their watches, having hearing aids, and you realize this is like the movies. These are the bodyguards. And suddenly he stood in front of me, the president of South Africa, and at that stage, still my enemy. He was 76 years of age. I was 24. The best years of his life behind him. The best years of mine awaiting. What do you do? The first thing he did was extend a hand to me. And I thought, am I, am I supposed to shake hands with the president? Can I not just turn around and walk away? I, I went into a state of panic. And I thought, well, you have to reciprocate, and I took his hand. And throughout the conversation, he held my hand into a firm grip. The first thing I felt was the calluses inside his hands from the years of hard work, hard labor in prison. And I held onto his hand, and there was a conversation happening. But suddenly there was a pause, and I thought, well, he asked me something, and I didn't hear or understood what he was saying. 
So when I requested him to repeat himself, I realized he was speaking to me in Afrikaans, my mother tongue, the language of the oppressor, the people who imprisoned him. And it's not that his Afrikaans wasn't good, but the last thing my brain expected was that this man would speak to me in my language. And over the years, I heard him say that when you speak to a man, it goes to his head. But when you speak to a man in his language, it goes to his heart. And that's what he did that day. In that moment, Nelson Mandela recognized my humanity. And in that moment, I decided to be present. What I found in that moment was completely the opposite of what I was told about Nelson Mandela. He was kind, he had this generosity on his face. He reached out to me, and undeservingly so. He showed me humanity despite my ideology. It was a life-changing moment, as you can imagine. This was what this man's legacy was all about for me, grasping every opportunity every moment to shape his legacy, one of forgiveness, one of unifying people, reconciling people, preaching for peace. At every opportunity, he was present in doing that. I decided, well, this is where I am now, and I need to change my attitude about life. I needed to focus and shape my legacy as well. And it started the transformation process with me, in which I even had to forgive the people who indoctrinated and manipulated me and sold me an idea and a narrative in history in which I was always the superior master and a black person, always the inferior servant. You see, we all have choices. Every day, you are here by choice tonight. Nelson Mandela had a choice too. After he was released from prison, he said that he could not truly enjoy his freedom unless he rid himself of the anger and the resentment that he had. He decided to forgive it was a choice, or else he would still be imprisoned by his resentment. I, too, decided that I needed to work on my prejudice and my, and my, and my stereotyping. And you know, racism is not a thing, it's not necessarily an action. It is a way of thinking, which I had to undo over the years. When Nelson Mandela stood on a stage, he addressed tens of thousands of people at a time, whether it was me as an individual or any person that he met, or on stage addressing a big crowd of people, his message was consistent, always making the choice to create a better world and create the world that he wanted to live in. You'll agree with me that our lives are ruled these days by social media, right? They say they call it the, we call it the age of smartphones and stupid people. And that's truly what it is. Our reach, because of our interconnectivity, our reach is far much wider. But therefore, our responsibility is also so much bigger. Can I have hands here in the audience? How many of you are not on any kind of social media, whether it's, oh, there's one, one, two, three. Okay, there's a few people that's saved from the rest of us, saved from this life we lead. So say we are about 600 people in this audience, and conservatively speaking, we all have a reach of about 200 people across our, all, all our platforms. Of course, it's much more than that, but just estimates. It means that we have a reach in this room tonight of 120,000 people. Can you see how powerful we've become? And what are we doing with that power? Are we reusing it in the now to create a better world like Nelson Mandela did? We are forever on the sinking ship of social media. Our self-worth is measured by the amounts of likes or retweets we get. And often we fall for the popular opinion or take part in popular opinion to attain that popularity we all strive for. And we lose rationality in the doing so. What will you do with the responsibility with this newly attained power that you have because of social media? If you look at recent world events, what happened two weeks ago in New Zealand, for instance, we are confronted more than ever about our differences as human beings. 
we are no longer looking at the similarities. We are looking confronted by what, what, what sets us apart. Science has shown that we are 99% the same. So all of us in this room share DNA of 99%. It's the 1% of our looks, our build, our language, our heritage, 1% only. That's the difference of the people in this room. Why do we choose to continuously focus on the differences and not seek out the common humanity amongst us? Something that Nelson Mandela taught us and we should have learned from his legacy. You know, we will get angry and I've made a choice. Being on social media, it's a risk. I've made a choice that I will get angry and disillusioned and disappointed. But the choices I make, even with the things I say on social media, should really enhance the lesson I've learned from Nelson Mandela. And that is that my, whatever I say, my choices, should always reflect my hopes and not my fears. I bear witness to this wonderful man's life. I saw him being present in the now every single day of the 19 years I worked for him, wanting to change the world, wanting to shape his legacy. It takes consistency and effort, deliberate effort, effort every single day. I saw him waking up, deciding every day that if he touches one person's life today, he could change the world. And we all know from history that is exactly what he did. So, ladies and gentlemen, please remove your, take out your cell phones rather. Take them out, you are allowed to have them. No one is gonna ask you to leave if you have them out, except for the three people not on social media. <laughs> please take, take them out and decide whether you're gonna make a choice tonight. Decide if you are going to create a legacy for yourself. I always say to people, be careful, your, grand, great, your great grandchildren that's not even born yet is gonna Google you one day. They're gonna find all the things you said on the internet. But please, please make a choice tonight whether you want us to create a better society, whether you want us to connect the common humanity between people all over the world. Let's send a message out into the world if you agree and tweet or Facebook or take a photo of the screen that I'll bring up now. And let's make the choice and honor Nelson Mandela's legacy by this message, sending this message into the world. Let's always choose humanity over ideology. I thank you.